Dr. Sproki is is here just anxious to maybe take those three minutes and, and run with them. So um, so thank you, Dr. Sproki, for joining us. And um, the floor is- hear me. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you okay. and see you. You're and um, hopefully you've got control of your slides. So the floor is yours. I'm just gonna double check here. Yep, now I do. Okay, so I tried to add a little four in my, my title besides the 4-H. So the title of my talk is Before Fractures Occur in 4-H and how we can optimize bone health um, for patients and families with 4-H. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bernard, for um, implicating me in this um, in terms of bone health. I'm also an endocrinologist, and as you'll soon see, hormones are also very important for bones. So um, I have no disclosures related to this topic, although I do feel that I am solar powered. I love my vitamin D. I love the sunshine. And I'm hoping that it'll come here soon in Montreal where I live because it's been a very gray April. We actually, we actually had snow this week. So hoping for that sun to come out soon. So the objectives of my short talk are to identify the risk factors for osteoporosis and 4-H leukodystrophy. We'll discuss how to address these risk factors for osteoporosis and 4-H leukodystrophy. And finally, we'll describe the investigations that you can discuss um, having done with your healthcare practitioner for bone health monitoring in 4-H leukodystrophy. So I just want to review bone anatomy. So um, you'll see that bone has two types of um, tissue. So there's the trabecular bone. Um, I'm hoping you guys can see my cursor. So that's the kind of spongy internal part of bone. And that's where you find most of the bone marrow that have a lot of the blood cells and all sorts of other um, functions that are very important uh, for our bodies. And then on the outside, we have the compact bone. So this is the protective bone um, that is very important um, for uh, housing all of our important organs as well. And um, you can see that there's also some nerves that run through the bones as well. And then if we dived in a little in a little bit closer, inside the bone, there are cells that build the bone. So those are called osteoblasts. So I, I always say B for building bone. And they lay down um, unmineralized um, layer. And then that subsequently becomes mineralized with calcium and phosphate. And the vitamin D is important because it helps absorb calcium into the body. And then once uh, the bone becomes mineralized, that osteoblast becomes kind of stuck inside the bone as an osteocyte. But bone doesn't just hang out, it's a very dynamic structure. And in fact, every time the bone um, hits itself or you know, there's just chronic um, injuries ongoing, um, the bone needs to be repaired and regenerated. And that's where osteoclasts come into play. So C for chewing. So the osteoclasts come along and they, they chew up uh, old bone. So our bone is always in this modeling and remodeling cycle. So it's really, really important. And so this whole... Um, balance of modeling and remodeling um, is under the inf influence of calcium, vitamin D, and phosphate, but also your sex hormones. So estrogen and testosterone are very, very important for this functioning as well. So I thought we'd go through the objectives using a published case. There's very few published studies about osteoporosis in 4-H leukodystrophy. Um, so that is why I think if you can fill out your questionnaires, that would be also very helpful because there is a whole section about bones. Um, so this was one case I found in the literature. So this was a 41-year-old female with 4-H leukodystrophy. And she had had a history of a right femur fracture. So the femur is the big long leg bone. And that occurred after a tonic clonic seizure at 30 years of age. She had presented with pain and swelling of the leg. And of course, with these symptoms, it really impacted her quality of life. And it actually subsequently led to more fractures and more pain. And she got into this whole fracture refracture cycle. And you can see on the x-ray, um, it doesn't look like much, but in fact, where the arrow is, there was a tiny little fracture and it actually required surgical intervention. So little fractures of the femur actually can result in a significant um, surgical uh, repair. So what is her diagnosis? Is it A, osteopenia, 
B, osteoporosis, C, osteomalacia, or D, rickets. And don't feel bad if you don't know the answer because that's the point of this is to, to learn something new. So the diagnosis is actually osteoporosis. So osteopenia just means low bone mineral density. Osteomalacia is when the bone is just poorly mineralized with calcium and vitamin D and phosphate. Rickets is when the bone is poorly mineralized at the level of the growth plate. So it's in a growing skeleton, so children and adolescents. And osteoporosis in pediatrics, we reserve for when a fracture is present in conjunction with low bone mineral density. So the true, di um, the true histologic um, changes that you could see with osteoporosis is literally porous bones, so holes in bones. So you can see normal bone on, on one side, and then you can see how a bone with osteoporosis has lots of holes. So you can imagine it can fracture very easily. So when we talk about pediatric osteoporosis, it's a little trickier than an adult osteoporosis. If any of you are adults and you've gone for your bone mineral density test, you might get something called a T-score. And based on that score, you could get a diagnosis of osteoporosis. But in pediatrics, in the growing skeleton, we don't just look at a bone mineral density Z-score. You actually have to have it accompanied with a clinically significant fracture and a bone mineral density Z-score. So I'll talk a little bit more about that after but it's a Z score we use in pediatrics. So PEDS, I use Z. And so if those two are present, that is osteoporosis. Or if you have just a vertebral compression fracture, that is osteoporosis, no matter what your bone mineral density Z score is. So what is a clinically significant fracture? I'm not talking about little fingers or little toes. We're talking about the long bones of the skeleton. So if you have a long bone fracture of your arms or your legs, and that's in the absence of trauma, that is a clinically significant fracture. And that should ideally be accompanied with this poor bone mineral density Z score. And we use a Z score of less or equal to minus two. So it's similar to a growth chart where you can take the age of the child and the machine will give um, a value and you can see it's the number of standard deviations away from the mean, which is at zero. So you can see in this case, this is a low score. Now, the vertebral compression fracture alone is enough to say it's osteoporosis because vertebral fractures should never occur in pediatrics in the absence of trauma. And when we talk about a vertebral compression fracture, it's just that it's a compression. So it's not a line through the bone of the spine. It's really a smushed bone and those can result in significant back pain. So I've spoken about the clinically significant fracture, a long bone fracture. And now I'll talk a little bit more about that bone mineral density test. So this, this, the fancy name for it is called a DEXA test. So it's a dual energy X-ray absorptometry. So dual because there's two X-rays that are passed through the bones. And um, we look at a bone mineral density test because it acts as a proxy for measuring the bone strength, how strong the bone is. And we classically measure in pediatrics, the lumbar spine and the total body minus the head. But there are problems with this test, especially in the growing skeleton, because it just, it's two x-ray beams pass through the bones and the beams that are not absorbed are detected on the other side of the body and a score is, is given. But it doesn't actually tell us anything about the quality of the bone, the geometry of the bone. It's just what did the x-rays go through versus what did they not go through? And then we get a score. So like I said, in pediatrics, we use a Z score, and that's the number of standard deviations away from the mean of somebody who's the same age and gender. So if you have a Z score of minus two, it means the bone mineral density is two standard deviations below the mean for somebody of the same age and gender. Whereas in adults, we use a T score. And this is the standard deviation score away from somebody of the same gender, but somebody who has attained their peak bone mineral density. And that is usually in our 30s. So that's why we don't use that in, in pediatrics. So if a, an adult has a T-score of minus 2.0, it means that their bone mineral density is two standards below the mean bone mineral density, for example, a 30-year-old female or for a 30-year-old male. And that's because our peak bone mass, it really increases, especially during adolescent years. And we all obtain our peak bone mass around age 30. And then it all declines after then. So I always tell teenagers, especially, you can see that's the most 
um, rapid accrual bone mass you're going to have. And this is the time where you're building that bank. And once you hit 30, that is the most money, most bone you're going to have. And then it's just life. We all lose bone after that. And you can see that for obtaining peak bone mass, there's obviously genetics, but nutrition, calcium, vitamin D is important. Of course, weight bearing activity is very important. And unfortunately, illness and especially osteotoxic medications, especially glucocorticoids can decrease how quickly someone be, will obtain their peak bone mass. But remember puberty, those sex hormones, it's so important, especially in 4-H, that puberty and growth are also addressed to obtain that peak bone mass. Because you can see with age, all those little ladies post-menopause, they all have those vertebral fractures if they don't have good bone health monitoring. So it's really important to make sure that all of this gets addressed early on in childhood. So I said that this DEXA test isn't the best test, especially in the growing child. And that's because it actually doesn't measure your true bone mineral density. So if you go back to your physics class and you remember that true density is mass over volume cubed, it's not the same case for what the machine is actually measuring because one of the beams of the x-rays is in the same direction of a three-dimensional structure. So you're actually just getting an aerial measurement. So a taller child, may have this density as a shorter child, but because that shadow that's casted, because it's an aerial measurement by the x-rays in the machine, because that taller child has a longer shadow, the taller child will always look like they have a higher bone mineral density when maybe the inside of that bone, because remember I said the test doesn't measure the qual quality, maybe it's not as good as as the shorter child. So it's really always important to look at the height relative to the interpretation of the bone mineral density test. So for instance, here, this is a 14 year old child who looks like their Z score is far below zero. So let's say for uh, example, it's minus two. But if their height is the average of a 10 year old, well, then you can see that if you correct for the short stature, you can see that, well, actually maybe the bone mineral density Z score isn't so bad when you correct for height. So that's why in pediatrics, we really move away from just looking at a bone mineral density test and we really need that fragility fracture. So a fracture in the absence of trauma, ideally you can do the bone mineral density to, to, to follow it much like a growth curve. So you either have that long bone fracture or a vertebral compression fracture. So if we go back to our case, now that we've clarified some, some definitions, we have this 41-year-old female, 4-H leukodystrophy, who fractured her right femur. And this was in the context of just having a tonic-clonic seizure when she was 30. On history, it turns out that she was dependent on her wheelchair. She was not no longer able to walk since age 15 because she had progressive gait disturbance. She had cerebellar ataxia and spasticity, which we heard about this morning. And she was on carbamazepine and phenytoin for recurrent seizures. She also had a gastrostomy because she aspirated. And in fact, when she was examined, she actually had absolutely no breast development or pubic hair, and she actually never had a period. So what are her risk factors for having osteoporosis? I'm sure you can pick out a few. Well, she was wheelchair dependent. So being immobile is a risk factor for osteoporosis. The more you move, the more our bones grow. Um, she had recurrent seizures and she was on some anticonvulsants and anticonvulsants can impair vitamin D metabolism. She had a gastrosomy for aspiration. So it gives you a sense of what was her nutrition like because you need good building blocks to have good strong bones. And she had no breast development. And as I told you, your sex hormones are very, very important for your bone health. So we're gonna look at each one in a little bit more detail. So how can we address these risk factors for osteoporosis now that we know the risk factors? So let's start with the wheelchair. So movement and bones. So anytime the muscle is putting a bone under stress by causing movement of the body, there's a mechanical load. And so um, 
the osteocytes, those cells that live inside the bone, they are really smart. They talk to each other with little caniculi, and I call those like little bone highways. So whenever there's a stress placed on a bone, those osteocytes are going to send little signals through the little bone highways, and they're going to tell those osteoblasts, those building cells to then move and start doing their job to build bone. So you have a stress, a, a communication to those building cells of the bone to grow. And they cause the bone to grow in width, especially during growth. Because if a child is growing in length, but the bone is not growing in width, you can imagine it continues to grow, 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 but become really skinny. So it's easier to, to break. So even with just a transfer, if the child is in a wheelchair going to their bed and they inadvertently whack their, the femur, you can imagine it would be easier for it to break. So it's really important to have that mechanical stimulation to continue healthy bone development. And so that is why when children can no longer be mobile, at least by getting them in a standing frame, it's not as good, obviously, as having that that bone muscle interface, but at least by having a little bit of pressure on the bone, it can certainly help to stimulate those osteoblasts to, to help. And it also helps with constipation, just being upright with gravity. So what can we do about seizures and, and carbamazepine and phenytoin and other anticonvulsants? Well, seizures and anticonvulsants. Let's talk about those. If the muscle contraction during a tonic-clonic seizure is strong enough to exceed the bone strength, then of course fractures can occur. And as I mentioned earlier, anticonvulsants in calcium vitamin D absorption. And which anticonvulsants are particularly osteotoxic? So first off, carbamazepine, phenny, uh, toin and phenobarbital all modify your vitamin D source to make them less active. But valproic acid is particularly um, toxic to bones because it does all of the same things as those other anticonvulsants, but it also directly affects those bone cells. So it'll actually increase those osteoclasts that chew up bone to, to chew up more bone. And it also prevent or promotes phosphate loss from the, the kidneys from the in the urine. So you don't have as much phosphate that needs to bind to the calcium to make your bones nice and strong. Um, so what about the calcium and the vitamin D intake? How much should everybody be getting in their diet or from supplements? First off, we always want to promote um, calcium in the form of the diet because it's better absorbed. And so you can see, as I showed you earlier, most bone um, injures between nine to 18 years of age need 1300 milligrams of calcium a day. And then after that, it's back down to the 1000. So what kind of foods have calcium? Most of us know that milk has calcium and each glass of milk has 300 milligrams, but children and adults don't just need to have milk. There's a whole variety of other foods that have um, calcium with them. Um, so, uh, not all children love eating sardines, but there are some, um, healthy fruits, oranges, uh, some vegetables, uh, broccoli, spinach, um, almonds also have uh, good amounts of calcium. So, um, it would be, um, advisable to just kind of keep track of what they're, they're getting in their diet. And then in terms of vitamin D, it's always the issue. How much vitamin D should I be giving? You don't want to give too much if you're immobile, because then you can be at higher risk of having too much calcium absorption and a risk of kidney stones. But if your health practitioner is checking vitamin D levels, as long as the 25 hydroxy vitamin D level is over 50 nanomoles per liter, then you're, you're never gonna have any problems with your bones. And the 25 vitamin D level is the marker of your vitamin D stores. Um, so really just as long as you have a level of 50 or more, you're never gonna be worried about not having enough vitamin D to absorb the calcium and strengthen your bones. So if we go back to our case, our, our female also had a gastrostomy for aspiration. So why is this also a risk factor for potentially having some um, bone compromise? Well, it may be an indicator of disease severity and malnutrition. So you need good nutrition. Um, if you're underweight, it can contribute to progression of osteoporosis. It's similar to, to females with anorexia nervosa. Um, they're also not going to have their periods. Um, and so again, you're lacking estrogen. And in fact, there was um, a, a, an observation that children who were exclusively fed 
via their gastrostomy tube with an amino acid-based formula called Neocate had low phosphate. And low phosphate is so important as well for um, mineralizing, uh, mineralizing your bones. So um, as long as a child is also eating PO with a gastrostomy formula, their phosphate should be fine. And even if they're on Neocate uh, through their gastrostomy with uh, PO, they'll be fine. But if they're exclusively on Neocate, then the health practitioner should be checking for phosphate levels as well. In addition, many of um, the children and the families with, with 4-H um, may have reflux, and so they might be on proton pump inhibitors. Um, and it's just important to note that these can inhibit calcium absorption at the level of the gut. So in those cases, maybe a little bit of extra calcium might need to be added uh, to the medication regime. And finally, if we discuss about puberty, so she had no breast development or pubic hair and never had a period. And as we heard earlier, that um, puberty um, is very common, uh, either doesn't occur, it arrests, um, and um, in females, um, no menstruation ever occurs in 81% of the, that cross-sectional study and some other studies. And it's really from that master gland, the pituitary gland, that doesn't send that LH and FSH, the hormones from the anterior pituitary, to tell the ovaries to make estradiol. And estrogen is so important for bone metabolism. It really helps those osteoblasts build bone. So bone formation, and it blocks those osteoplasts from resorbing too much bone, because you always want to have a nice balance of um, osteoblast and osteoclastic activity. If you do an x-ray of the hands, um, that's called a bone age. And so you can get a sense of how old is the bone relative to the age of the child. And so with delayed puberty, um, if we do a bone age, we can see that if their bone age is delayed, um, it's, an, it's a clue that um, their, their puberal and growth status needs to be monitored very closely and they may need intervention. And in fact, there is some discussion that, well, it's really important to get the estrogen on board. If there is a delayed puberty, especially if they're, the child is going to be at risk for having decreased ambulation, because if you do start estrogen, then there is a concern, well, could this increase the risk of blood clots? There haven't been any of these reported to my knowledge yet, but it's just something to keep in mind. So if we go back to our case, we've looked at our risk factors, we've looked at how to address them, and that brings me to my last objective. So what investigations should we be doing then? So for sure, you can ask your health practitioner to be doing uh, blood work at least once a year. So um, it's really important to, to monitor the hormones. And in fact, in this case, when the hormones were checked in our, our 41 year old, she had undetectable LH and FSH, which makes sense because the, the anterior pituitary gland wasn't making them. And of course the ovaries then couldn't make the estrogen. And then, um, she had her um, calcium and her phosphate and her vitamin D, and then another hormone that's so important to regulate calcium in the blood is called parathyroid hormone. They were checked, but they were all normal. And then she did have a bone resorption marker, which was checked and it was elevated, just saying that her bones were resorbing more than they were building. And she did have a bone mineral density score. And because she's an adult, um, it was a T-score, and you can see it was reported to be very, very low at minus 4.9 of the spine. So what I recommend is blood work at least once a year. So obviously just a good nutritional panel because you need those building blocks, good nutrition for good strong bone, but of course your calcium, your vitamin D, your phosphate and your sex hormones. A urine calcium, because you don't want to be over treating with too much vitamin D um, and then absorbing too much calcium, especially if a child or an adult is mobile, you don't want to have a higher risk of kidney stones. So as long as you're, you're on 400 inter -unit, international units of vitamin D, you won't get into trouble. It won't be toxic. You could probably even go up to a thousand, but definitely no more than that a day of vitamin D. Uh, imaging should be done every year to every two years, starting around age eight, around the time where growth and puberty should also be at its optimal um, time. So what could be done? So that DEXA test, even though it's not the best test, it just starts to give you a good baseline and then you can repeat it to follow to make sure you're accruing bone mineral density, much like a growth curve. Do the lateral thoracic spine x-ray and a lumbosacral possibly as well to rule out the vertebral compression fractures. And that's because if the bones are soft and, and children have poor posture, then the, the, the bones can become a little bit more smushed and can cause severe pack pain. But they can also be asymptomatic and it's important to catch them before this occurs. 
if a child is on glucocorticoids for whatever other reason, prednisone, um, they're at even higher risk to have vertebral compression fractures because steroids really like to attack the bones of the spine. And then, of course, that bone age that I talked about earlier can be done just to get a sense of how old uh, the bone is compared to the chronological age and also gives a sense of how well mineralized it is. So here, these are just um, some examples of vertebral compression fractures. So a nice um, vertebral body should have this rectangular appearance, but you can see here they're smooshed. So these are considered vertebral compression fractures, similarly here in the thoracic region. So this is a side view where the child is looking to the side. This is the thoracic spine, and here is the lumbar spine. And it's really important to start checking them because they, they can be asymptomatic. Um, and once one starts, it, it sets off this cascade. So it'd be very, very uh, important to, to just make sure that those are, are done. Um, because once they do occur, they can be very painful. So if we go back to our adult, she was treated with denosumab. So this is a bone resorption inhibitor. Um, and she actually recovered completely her bone mineral density and had no additional fractures. So huge success story. Unfortunately, we don't use this medication in pediatrics. What we use are bisphosphonates. So um, these are um, medications that block the osteoclast, the, the bones that chew up uh, or the cells that chew up the bone. So the blasts, the osteoblasts can keep building bone at a faster rate than the, the bone is removed. Um, in pediatrics, we do not give oral bisphosphonates. We actually use intravenous bisphosphonates. So you might've heard of pomidronate or zoledronic acid, and these are reserved for once a fracture occurs. Um, there's no good prevention studies um, and they are um, not without some side effects. In fact, once you commit to starting it, um, you have to continue until growth is done because the new bone that's coming out, if it's weaker and it meets the strong bone that was treated, it can fracture at the junction. And what's really interesting is that each cycle of IV bisphosphonate leaves a little band, a dense band, um, at the growth plate, which will move as the child grows. So if ever you have an x-ray in front of you and um, your child or, or somebody you know how to bisphosphonate intravenous and you see these lines, well, that's what that was from. So after the first infusion of bisphosphonates, there are some horrible flu-like symptoms. Children have fever, nausea, vomiting, lots of myalgias, arthralgias, so lots of bone pain, muscle pain, joint pain. It's really not fun. And because we're blocking those cells that chew bone, well, bone is a huge reservoir of calcium. So you're blocking that calcium from being released. So the calcium can drop and it usually reaches a, a its lowest point about three days after. So it's really important that there's a lot of um, dairy products that are being take, taken within that. Adults, there's been some reported cases of osteonecrosis of the jaw. So the, the bone of the jaw just has severely um, been infect, affected with holes and it, it dies, necrosis is death, um, but that hasn't been reported in kids. So if we look back at our objectives, um, we went through the risk factors for osteoporosis in 4-H leukodystrophy. So we talked mainly about the lack of sex hormones, immobility, epilepsy, and the medication used for it, a gastrostomy, uh, potentially as a marker of poor nutrition. We looked at how to address these risk factors. So making sure that um, the growth and the pubertal exams are being done early on and, and, and treating appropriately if needed. Good nutrition, calcium, vitamin D, and a standing frame if the child especially is immobile. Um, and then we looked at investigations for bone health monitoring. So some important blood work, good nutritional stores, calcium, vitamin D, the other hormones as well, doing that DEXA or that bone density test and lateral spine x-rays and a uh, bone age. So take home points, early onset, um, adult onset osteoporosis can occur um, if it's not monitored for in pediatrics, and it can really result in pathologic fractures, and it severely impacts activities of daily living. So we want to do some early evaluation and prevention um, as soon as the diagnosis of 4-H leukodystrophy is made. So I'm uh, inviting you to ask questions, but I do want um, you to answer the questions in the questionnaire that um, has been sent out. Um, so I'm happy to answer anything, and thank you for your attention and having me today.